Welcome to Lifestyles of the Jet Setters and Celebrity Entrepreneurs. Uh, today, my guest star is a living genius, a legend, a visionary. Welcome Dr. Joe Marcella to help us discover a new law about our reality called the law of repeat repeatlessness so you can live an empowered life. He has been awarded, honored globally, and given many accolades, yet he likes to think of himself as the average Joe. He is the author of the internationally best-selling book, Repeatlessness, an owner's manual to the human mind. Dr. Joe has over 21 million people following his work, and he has studied with, worked with, and is endorsed by some of the greatest minds in the world, from Ram Das, Dr. Wayne Dyer, Jack Canfield, Dr. John Demartini, Har Harold Bloomfield, The New York Times, Science Spirit, and many more. Dr. Michelle has created the polysynthetic equilibration technique, which is called the P-SET method. He has developed several unique courses for the public, including empowerment, relationship versus union, conscious parenting. His corporate classes include quantum, oh my gosh, quantum learning techniques, visual graphic reading, motivation versus inspiration, which was taught to Fortune 500 companies and college campuses around the nation. He has been lecturing, counseling, coaching, and teaching for over 30 years. Joe's passion, you ask? Finding every possible avenue of expression to bring us all together, at least in thought, with each other and with all of life in the environment. Dr. Joe! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to you see house. why I want to have everybody just think of me as the average Joe? Because all of that is just like way too much. I've been really busy. <laughs> you have been really, really busy. And um, so for those of you who have not met Dr. Joe Marshalla, I have seen him on YouTube. He caught my attention as I was, you know, thinking of MindWorks. And as soon as I saw one of his videos, I said to myself, I must bring him on Lifestyles and introduce him. Uh, to the world for any of you that have not uh, been introduced to him yet. Um, so Dr. Joe, I know that your story, I heard a little bit about it, but I'd like for you to share it. I know that you have died and come back several times. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, so can you share with us how those experiences altered your perspective on reality? Oh, sure. H how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a few questions, but I was just curious, you know? <laughs> okay. Well, I, it's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really big question, you know? It is a big all, question. I just really hope that, um, you know, what we share here today and, and our conversation really helps to uplift and nurture everyone who's watching this. I mean, I mean that genuinely. That's why I'm alive. Having died, you really change your perception and your motivation in life. Really, you, you question why you're here when you come back. Now, I've had multiple health opportunities, as I call them, one of which left me brain dead for over 12 hours. Oh, wow. And it's a really long story. I actually have a, a lecture where I, I teach what I experienced during that period called Dead Man Talking. You can find all this on my website. I'm not going to do a big sales thing. Right. And I don't were, you talk conscious? were you conscious of it when you were um, dead, I guess? Um, <laughs> well, that's the, that's the best kind of to try and characterize it in the English language was there an awareness that was present during that whole process yes. absolutely yes and did I get to experience multiple different kind of dimensions yes um, what I teach is that 99% of what people have ex what we've heard about the death experience literally has been near death experiences mm -hmm. and that's very different than death experiences um, and I've had three death experiences and I go into the difference and differentiation, but in order to answer your question, um, what really helped me, the, the greatest benefit of those experiences was, um, I mean, just like two years ago, I had another one of these opportunities, had major surgery and then was in a coma for a couple weeks and then came out of that coma with amnesia. And I swear, if there was a pill, that I could sell that gave everyone amnesia, I'd be like the biggest pusher on the planet. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's the greatest thing in the world. It really is. I mean, to have no past that's kind of haunting you and then no worries about the future, like you need to be certain ways or what have you. But what happened, and each time I came back into my body, but, but this last time was really profound. Um, as the brain turns back on and self-perception begins to turn back on. I mean, because there I was, I've come out and I'm in amnesia, and I'm just laying there in the hospital and I'm just in pure bliss. 
I mean, just there's no, no history. There's no future. I'm just right here in the present moment, just experiencing energy kind of pouring through my being, pouring through life, all of life just occurring as it does. And then all of a sudden, my, you know, my, my reticular activating system kind of turns on as a specific part of the brain. And, and my prefrontal lobe and then my hippocampus. And as the brain parts are turning on, Unfortunately, I study neurology, so I know what these are as they're turning on. Right. And I'm watching it, but all these, all the you need to, you should, you ought to, all of the rules begin to kind of turn back on. And they were like, I had this beautiful, clear windshield, and all of a sudden, those brain parts are turning on. It's like someone's throwing mud at the windshield, and, and it's all of a sudden getting all cloudy with all of these, all of these, these self imposed regulations on how we need to be in order to be lovable and acceptable or seen as okay by our peers and by society and what have you. And so I've been given the gift through these death experiences, if you will, which I don't even talk so much about the death. There's only one time in the Dead Man Talking lecture that I really talk about what I experienced, right. but what I learned about life and what I learned about what blocks or gets in the way of our full passion and a full passion experience and, and expression in life is really what I want to share about what I learned from my death experiences because there's a whole series of systems and meta systems and systems behind those systems that are sitting here, you know, editing our, our true selves and, 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 and to make us, as I said previously, you know, acceptable socially or acceptable by our parents or our peers or what have you. And all of that's got to go if you truly want to be fully expressed and fully alive in this life. Wow. That, that's so amazing. So basically, uh, so your life basically changed from, you know, um, ha uh, having this awareness that these, these, um, your, your self-perception of yourself is turning on, like you said, the ought to, the should, and all this. So how do you go now through life, like knowing <laughs> that there's a state of bliss and that, how do you separate uh, the two? Is that what led you to write the book, The Law of uh, Repeatlessness? Is that what, what, what it discusses? Yeah, it's, that's a really great thing because, you know, we're, we're all in the pursuit of something, right? There's this part of our brain that's seeking information. And we think there's this ultimate truth that if I get to that ultimate truth, that whatever that is, then I'm going to be happy. Then I'll finally be fulfilled. Then I'll find that, that we're, we're like trying to, in this achievement oriented society, reach this state of enlightenment, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm here to say that, 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 <clears throat> that, is a, that is a folly to, to get caught in that trap. Um, that there is a process of enlightening mm -hmm. and there is a process of awarenessing, but there is no ultimate goal. I mean, I've met with, you know, all the people that were considered alive on the planet many years ago that, you know, were considered enlightened beings, if you will. Right. And the first thing that they would tell me is that I don't know why you guys keep projecting this onto me. <laughs> you know, they're like, <laughs> I'm sitting there trying to give you some tools so that you can experience the constant opening and awarenessing and enlightening process, but don't put me up on some pedestal in that way. So now, you know, the, you asked my, you asked a really good question. I mean, really good question about, you know, this, this, this dichotomy of seeing the dualities, right. you know, and, um, and the key element in, in kind of looking at that is that, and I talk about it in my book and I talk in some of my lectures about how, you know, this brain is constantly thinking and, and you can't stop it from thinking. If you attempt to stop it from thinking and, you know, you can't unplug it. If they unplug it, they unplug you. And that's the subject for a whole nother, you know. So, uh, so is, that, is that what amnesia is? It's an unplug of the, of the mind? Um, it is, it is, it is. It is, it is, well, it's actually those memories and that history is still in the field of energy that is your mind and oh, your I brain see. is like this interface, but amnesia, I would say, is the, the connection is severed from that part. Okay. okay. And, um, but what I was trying to, or what I'm trying to convey here is that there's a big difference from unplugging it or unplugging from it. Right. Okay. And the key element to understand is that if you can see it, hear it, think it, taste it, smell it, or think it, it's not you. Oh, wow. 
that you are not the conversation, the dialogue, the, the voice, like everyone, you know, there's, there's something called sub-vocalization and we're having this conversation with ourselves all day. You made a post on your Facebook page about the 50,000 self-talks a day, right? Right. That, it was inspired by on. you. Yeah. I was like, yeah. oh my God, that's when I discovered you. I'm like 50,000 self-talks a day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it was, it, and it was like a one to four ratio. We have like uh, four times more negative thoughts uh, for every positive thought that we have. That's correct. Yeah. That's, that's what we've shown in science. And based on the neurological and chemical responses that happen to those thought forms. But the point is, is that you have this thing that's continuously going on and, and who you are is not the speaker. Who you are is not the, the, the senses or any of that. Who you are, if you will, this is Reader's Digest version, very simple version. But right. what I'd like people to understand is that who or what you are is the listening. The listening to your vision, the listening to your your, 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 set, your tactile sensation, the listening to, so there's a place where you actually are listening to your feelings, right? I mean, listening, right. I mean, like, like I'm touching my hand and there's a place where I'm listening to that, if you will, you know, where I can feel it. We call it, but there's, so what you are, or who you are is the listener. And I even, I, I remove like the objective nature of that and say the listening, because I, I really believe, and I don't believe, I know, I mean, there's, there's right. one being here, right now there's one being talking to itself, being watched by itself, um, interacting with itself so that it can expand its understanding of itself. And that's your viewers and you and me, and it's all one being here interacting with itself. So to say, oh, oh, what a, what a charade. I mean, it looked like that. I, I almost believe that you were there in Florida talking to me here in Hawaii. And, right. <laughs> and that separation exists. But I know better than that. That there is so no separation. Answer, no, no. So answer to your question, though, that um, it can be really quite extraordinary. Um, you know, it's a little maddening for me every now and then when I see how so many of us take all that's important as unimportant and all that's important as unimportant. Right. And we, you know, and we're filling ourselves with all this unimportant stuff and, and, and trying to achieve the right look or trying to achieve the right fashion or the right car or the right job or the right whatever as our life just passes by and we don't really get to be who we're here to be. I mean, every single one of us, I mean, from the very beginning of time, let's think of it this way, from the very beginning, like the big bang or God waved his magic wand, but from the right. very beginning of time to right now, and from right now forevermore, there will never be another you. Okay, you're it. So what are you gonna do with that you? Because you've got this biocomputer right? This computer that's it's here to assist you. And unless you begin to activate and use it and work with it in order to assist you, your, your you-ness is being wasted. You have a very specific piece of the puzzle. I mean, each one of us has a very specific piece of the puzzle to help all of life raise up to a new level. So how can one change? How can one activate it without having, you know, death experiences and understanding this, um, um, you know, to understand what you understand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, tofu. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's all it takes. Just a, a little bit of tofu, and hey. <laughs> you know? Hold on. Be before I go into this question, actually, I, um, I, I was curious. Like, what led you to discover the law of repeatlessness? Was it your death experiences, or was it something that came through you, or was yeah, it? Yeah, no, it was long. It was long before the death experiences. Um, just so I want to define what the law of repeatlessness is for your yes, listeners, please, uh, your viewers. Sure. And um, the law of repeatlessness basically is a law about the here and now or the eternal present. Okay, we talk about that there's only the here and now, and now, and now, and now. And we talk about the eternal present moment as a concept that we come and visit every now and then, kind of like, whoa, you know, wow, it's only now. Um, however, it is actually a law that governs our entire perceptual reality. There are no two moments, no two experiences, no two anything that are ever exactly the same. Every moment, every nanosecond, Everything that exists is either taking on energy or shedding energy and is in a constant state of flux and change. Therefore, life is, in and of itself, a state of repeatlessness. Repeatlessness, where every moment is fresh and new. Now, when you accept 
that that is the truth of our reality. When you really, really get it, okay? When you really understand that and you grok it to the depth of your being, that every moment, this moment, is fresh and new, this, then you are giving yourself an opportunity that, that you can change, that you can actually alter the course of whatever is going on in your reality because every moment is fresh and new. And another thing that happens when you really take that in like that mm -hmm. is that you no longer attempt to recreate any experience. We spend an enormous amount of time. We might have a really deep meditation. We might have a really high experience on some, you know, swimming in the ocean or something like that. And we go back and we try and recreate that or a flavor, an orgasm or whatever. And we're constantly trying to recreate our experiences when we never will be able to. We might get close approximations, but we're on this, you know, never ending quest to recreate what we think life should be as opposed to be with what is. Oh, that's really interesting. To just be because what what is is what is. <laughs> you know? Right. And right. to learn how to drink the nectar of that. You know, to be okay with your present moment. You know, I have lots of affirmation classes and I, 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 we we're going to talk about, you know, reprogramming the brain and how you do that. But there's one right. affirmation, if I get it across to anybody, sure. you know, that, that it would be, I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm at peace as I am. In other words, nothing needs to change. Nothing needs to get better. And when you can really fall into that, that you are truly at peace as you are right here and now, then your natural vibration and all these would, shoulds, and needs to, and ought tos all begin to dissipate and, and disappear. And so you ask, you know, where did I come across the law of repeatlessness? Well, I came to me in a, in a you know, a deep meditative state. And I began to, um, I, I write about it in the book, um, you know, but it was a kind of a, you know, the Buddha moment underneath the Bodhi tree where all of a sudden, you know, all the pieces kind of came together, but I began to see how how I, I got to a place in my consciousness where I could see the energy kind of coming into the singular sensor, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like there's, 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 there's a singular sensor, if you will, in your brain or in your perceptual reality where all the other senses are coming in. Your thoughts are coming in, your hearing's coming in, your eyesight's coming in, your tactile, your electromagnetic, all of the sensors are all meeting in one place and they're all kind of coming together. And then our brain kind of looks at different things and gives attention to all these, you know, what senses it thinks are most important. But it's at that place where it's constant. It's a constant, fresh and moment new that's ever changing where all the senses are constantly coming in around that singular, ever-changing sensation. And I was given the gift to be able to actually stay there and to see it and to be with it. And as a result, that began to really kind of lead me to a greater understanding of the, the, the nature of our reality and the constant, you know, and then what was, what was causing my brain to look at certain things? What was causing my brain to begin to focus on certain things and not look at other things? And part of that is part of this, I mentioned it earlier, but what's called the reticular activating system, the RAS. Wow. And the reticular activating system is a filtering system. And its job is to confirm your beliefs about life and yourself. So, so can you give example, us a picture? Yeah, I was just going to say, can yeah. you give us a picture so we can? An example is if you think if you think some you know the people at work don't like you, okay, okay or that they don't like something about you, okay. your brain is going to be looking for any cues, any evidence, anything it can find to say, ah, see, look, so they, they see they don't like me, or they don't like this, and it's it's constantly on there in, in the search kind of looking. It's not looking like wow, they were nice to me today, isn't that something? No, it's, it doesn't even hear that but it's looking to justify. So your beliefs about yourself are being reinforced by this reticular activating system in your, in your life. It's, it, it, so, you, so what beliefs you carry about yourself and about your world and how the, what the world is and how you're gonna interact with it are gonna be reinforced by your own brain looking for and finding evidence of that in your reality. And that's how we organize and sort through our life. So it's really important to understand what your beliefs are, where you got your beliefs, and then really learn how to change them. Because if, if, unless you do, your whole life is just going to be filled with reaffirming all the negativity that exists in your brain about yourself and about how the world is. 
Right. So, doctor, so doctor, this is crazy. Okay. So basically if I'm thinking, uh, people don't like me at work, I think the thought and then my reality shows up or I'm going to focus on, on everybody who dislikes me at work. Like my, this is basically the, the way that it's going to show up. Yeah, even if they're not disliking you at work. You're going to find something about their behavior, the way they turn their head or the way they make a breath or something like that <laughs> into evidence. Okay. And so then they we, may have we turn it into a fact. It. Right. And yeah. So we turn it into facts. So we keep seeing more of that. Exactly. And, unt and until we change our thought about these people don't like me at work, we're only going to see always in our uh, reality, people that dislike me at work. We're always going to find things that, that, that will right. make this a fact. Exactly. Or I look fat or I sound unintelligent, or the world is hard, or making money is difficult, or whatever. I mean, every single one of those thoughts are going to be reinforced by the reticulating, <coughs> reticular activating system right. um, to be proven to be true, so that you, you, feel, um, okay, the, the, you feel right. You know right, what I mean? There's right. something that's very interesting. Um, in the 80s, um, a fellow named Wally Mento, Okay. Uh, Minto, Minto um, uh, one of my mentors, um, ran something called the Alpha Institute. And during the 80s, they did one of the largest psychological research profiling um, experiments that ever took place. And there were over 100,000 participants in the sample. It took about 10 years to do. Okay. And that's a huge sample. I mean, usually samples are maybe yeah. 100. And if you've got a huge sample, it's like 1,000. You had 100,000 people. And usually when I talk about this, I start, you know, the, with a question where I'll say, you know, what's more important than feeling love? Right? Mm -hmm. What's more important than feeling love? Well, in this study, one of the things that they revealed out of many things, and they wrote a book called The Results Book. I think it's still available. Results oh, wow. Book. And it gives okay. all the results of these 100,000 people. But one of the things that they discovered that was what, what has become more important than the feeling of love in human beings is the feeling of being right. Oh. That we will do what's wrong in order to appear right than do what's right and appear wrong. And so it gets so convoluted that if your parents say, you know, you're late, and you're, you're always late and your room's a mess. If you want to be seen right in your parents' eyes, which all of us do, it's an innate thing in almost all animals to be accepted and lovable or loved by their parents, Mm -hmm. And so the only way we can be right in that circumstance when our parents are accusing us of that is to always be late and have our room a mess. Right. So this concept of being right has really taken over our perceptual reality and has taken over our entire experience of life. And so this reticular activating system is going, it, it, it is now programmed to make even the negative stuff that you think about yourself or the world to be seen so that you can feel right and justified. See, I knew it. See, that proves that proves that the world sucks and it proves that, you know, I'm going to, whatever. Right. Like, oh, I'm late. Oh yeah. You know, or, yeah. or, or, you know, oh, you're always late. Oh, cause I'm always late. You know, so you're going to prove to yourself that yes, you're always late. Right. And more so though, the perceptual reality of, of, I mean, the only thing that I really think that everyone's looking for, I mean, it, it, we, I, when it boils down to it, I mean, I've been working on, I've been doing this stuff for right, right. 40 years, you know, and the main thing that I think that, that everyone's looking for is peace of mind. Everyone's looking for some sort of peace of mind. And they think that having more money is going to bring them that peace of mind or having more information is going to bring more peace of mind. But what is peace of mind? Right. I, I don't think that many of us know what that really means. What is peace of mind? You know, like, how can you have peace of mind? You know, it's easy to have peace of mind when everything around you and your world is, you know, <laughs> at ease. <laughs> but, let's just say, <laughs> but let's just say when our world is in distress, yeah. how, how do we as human beings um, have peace of mind? You know, if somebody's looking at their bank account and, you know, um, and yeah. that, you know what I mean? They, they I do. Happy they feel that pressure. <laughs> How can you, what is a trick? Maybe that would be so good to, uh, to say, what would be a trick that they can do to still be at peace of mind, despite what is going on out in their outside reality. If, if you want yeah. to. Help. I think what you have to do first, and at least for myself, what I recommend is that you have to understand what peace of mind is. 
right? Right. And so is it is it different for everybody? You know, is my peace of mind different than your peace of mind? And um, so we have to under, under we have to understand the underlying principles of this concept of peace of mind. What is that? Right. And um, technically, um, neurologically, I would approach it that that peace of mind is the recognition of patterns. Okay, uh, let me I'll further explain that. So we recognize certain things. So there's no, there's no confusion. We recognize it. So like when we first, the, let's use driving a car as an example. When we first get in a car, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we don't have a lot of peace of mind. We don't know how far to turn the wheel, how hard to push the gas, how, how you know, to keep, you know, the, the vehicle in the lane, um, how to, far to turn. I mean, I, you know, all the things that are right. a car, how much to break. I mean, it's like, but as we do it more and more and more, we begin to recognize the patterns of how far you turn and this car, you do it a little less, you you know, and you, we begin to learn all the patterns that make it so that car driving is very easy for us. And then eventually we have peace of mind about driving a car and we can think about everything else while we're driving the car and we no longer have to think about anything. It just becomes right. what's called base brain activity. So in that regard, you know, peace of mind is the recognition of patterns that, you know, the moment that the brain wants to find something negative, um, to be able to recognize that and rec oh look brains going off into that negative spiral mm -hmm. And so we recognize that when it does that it's going to send off certain chemicals into our body make us feel a certain way But we can do some breathing exercises or go take a cold shower or do something else or switch it in our brain or Simply feel the feelings and wow. not try and push them away because it is through feeling our feelings that we find our healings and so this is a whole series you know, so basically everything I do, I mean, I, you know, people you can gain access to all my stuff, 99% of my stuff for free online, you know, is right. provi providing the tools to understand these things so that you can become more self-aware, recognize your patterns, and in recognizing those patterns, then install some new patterns so that then you can maintain this state of peace of mind regardless of what's going on. Right. But Dr. Joe, do you think that people can recognize their patterns? Because, you know, like your patterns, and I'm going to say this from my past, you know, my patterns were normal to me, that I was not able to recognize them on my own yeah. until um, I worked, you know, <laughs> I work with different people. And of course, I got different awarenesses. Uh, today, yeah. I'm a different person I can recognize. But back then, um, I was like, oh, I didn't even know that I was thinking that, you know what I yeah. mean? I was not I aware of my own patterns because it seemed normal to me. And right. uh, of course, all my environment had the same patterns because my environment is where I got those patterns from. <laughs> right. So, you know what I mean? So, yeah. So, well, you, I talk about in one of my lectures, uh, one of the ones I think you watch, um, you know, the three areas of knowledge. Okay. Right. And um, we have one area of knowledge that's what we know that we know. So, mm -hmm. you know that you know how to tie your shoes. You know that you know how to brush your teeth, right? Mm -hmm. You know that. You know you know how to add numbers. You know that you know those things, okay? So that's one area of knowledge. Right. The second area is what we know that we don't know, okay? So I know that I don't know the escape velocity of a rocket to get out of the Earth's atmosphere, okay? I know that. I know that I don't know the molecular weight of plutonium, okay? Mm -hmm. I know that I don't know. So there's a whole series of things that I know I know, there's mm -hmm. things that I know that I don't know. Right. Right. But then there's this third area of what we don't know that we don't know. Right. Okay. And it is from that area that new awareness and new understandings and new reflections begin to um, provide us an opportunity to then realize because we don't know that we don't know it, then we right. realize that we know that we don't know it, whatever it is. Uh, and, so, okay. and as we put more awareness towards it, we then put it into this, what we now we know that we know. Right. And so it's quieting the mind enough and directing it literally the question. I mean, it, 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 I talk in my book about the idea of reparenting yourself and literally being like the parent to yourself that your parents never were. Mm -hmm. And literally talking to yourself and saying, Joe, I know you don't understand that. I would talk to myself. I still do today. Joe, I know you don't understand that. Right. There's this crazy thing going on. But I'm so happy and grateful now that you are opening to letting your you know, reticular activating system find evidence of new things that you should maybe study. And new things so that you can bring greater awareness. You know, I, I share this idea that there's a part of us that's seeking. Okay, mm -hmm. There's the seeker. 
right? Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, like totally, like, you know, like you always think, oh, there's one more book or one more thing or one right. more. Right. You know, like, exactly. you, you never feel like at peace, like no matter how much information you get, uh, right. you know, all of a sudden another video pops and you're like, oh, maybe there's a little <laughs> nugget there that I didn't get, you know? Exactly. No, that's exactly where I'm going with that thought is the idea that this seeker um, is trying to understand and it thinks if it understands something, then it's finally going to know, right? But wow. as you just pointed out, that seeker, once it gets new information, it realizes there's another piece. And then once it gets that, then there's another piece. And it's just, ha, ha, ha. And it's constantly <laughs> seeking, you know? I so to, chasing. Always chasing exactly. information. Exactly. And so if you can really understand that that seeker is never going to end. And if it's never going to end, then it's never going to truly understand. And it's never truly going to know. Wow. And so... When you realize that, that, that the seeker never ends and it's never going to understand and it's never going to know, then the only thing that's left to do is to be, to yeah. just be. So just be at peace with what you know? <laughs> exactly. Be at peace. It, it even gets stepping outside of knowledge, just, just being, because thinking, see who you are and what you are, and see if we can get this, who you are and what you are is not in time. Right. It's okay. okay. So like it's consciousness. It's right. Your awareness, what you are, your listening, if you will, doesn't exist in time. It passes through time, but it itself is not in time. You see, in thinking, you were saying, you know, your thoughts be and, and, you know, be what you're thinking. It's like, well, yeah, be what you're thinking, but your thinking is not who you are. Thinking takes time, right? Mm -hmm. Feeling takes time. Perception takes time, but what you are and who you are is not in time. And so to be able to open to that possibility and to just sit in silence, to be able to begin to observe your thoughts. You see, now you were saying, how do you begin to redo this? How do you begin to, you know, to, do you think that you understand and you keep them? And, 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 and it's to begin a process of learning how to map your thoughts, to map your thinking, to map the cycles of your life. You know, your, your, your brain, as it, turns on when you're born, you know, goes through a seven year cycle and certain things happen in the first year so that it learns and then certain things in the second year. So it learns and third each year it goes through very specific learning criteria. And then at age eight, it begins again and it goes back to everything that you were learning in your first year. And then nine is everything you learned in your second year. And then you go through 14 and 15, you start again. And then at 22, you start again and then over and over and over these cycles of seven. Mm -hmm. And it's in these cycles of seven that you can begin to see the repeating patterns of what didn't get, you know, what, what happened right. <laughs> in yeah. your life that maybe you didn't come to peace with. And so you can kind of, with this, 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 this system that I teach, the cycles of seven can help you reverse engineer where the wiring went wrong, where the reticular activating system got its, its negative belief that now your brain has been for the last 20 years reinforcing. Right. right. Yeah. So it, it takes, you know, it, it's, it's, it's such an honor to be able to like interact with someone like you who is constantly, you know, questioning, constantly looking for something new. And, you know, and I'm sure you can attest for your listener's sake that, I mean, I know for myself and I'm sure you can agree with me here on this is that there are times where that turns off. And it's kind of like the tide comes in and the tide goes out and you have to be okay with the fact that your system once it gathers all this information and, and kind of upgrades to a new level, has to assimilate that whole level. And then it begins like, it feels like you've plateaued, like you've stopped, you know? And it's like, oh no, oh no. But then, you know, if you get into that, oh no, then you get stuck there. <laughs> so you, you begin to realize these cycles. You begin to recognize the patterns mm -hmm. so that then you can have peace of mind about the process of growth and enlightenment. Right. And so, right. Yeah. Cause there is, it's definitely a repeatable process and you, and you, uh, at a certain point you stop and you're like, Oh, wait a minute. You know, mm -hmm. this looks familiar, you know, Oh, I'm always reacting this way. Uh, when certain activities happen, you know, why am I screaming? Yeah. Why, why, why does this person like, why do I react when this person says a certain something? So you start like, you know, and what exactly. I loved about your talk, um, you were talking a lot about the, the this concept called unplugged dog dreams and you were ah. explaining, Oh my God, that concept just yeah. like, it's phenomenal because you explain a, I think it unplugged, you know, how we're always, uh, well, you can explain it like in a nutshell, basically how we're always turned on. Right. And we can't right. turn it off. 
So okay. that's the, right. Go ahead. Yeah. Go. Well, I'll give I'll give the short version. Yeah, the short version. version here. Right. Um, but anyone who goes to my website, you know, yeah. JoeMarshalla.com or RepeatLessness.com, right there on the opening screen, it says "Start Your Journey." If you click on that button, um, it takes you right then. I mean, it just opens up to the first chapter of the first audio book chapter of my book called uh, "Repeatlessness," and the first chapter is what I'm about to explain. But this is a 30 minute explanation that really dives into it but i'm just right. going to give like the three minute version here so you can just go there anyone and just click on start your journey and listen to the first chapter for free and, absolutely uh, and i'll put all the links i'll put all the links at the bottom <laughs> I, I did it myself yeah. <laughs> and uh i've seen like a lot of your videos but please go ahead and explain it and guys i, I will put all the links so it'll make it very easy for you to go and and uh, so the basic idea is unplugged dog dreams which is kind of a silly little phrase but each yeah. one of those words unplugged dog and dreams stands for a psychological experiment and each one of these experiments took place in different decades and they're completely unrelated so they're completely unrelated individual psychological experiments that took place in three different decades whose findings when put in a particular sequence create an undeniable irrefutable explanation as to why we are the way we are as human beings on the planet today so it's a significant piece and um, that, that, that alone, along with the law of repeatlessness, now has been cited in over 29 dissertations um, you know, for people's PhDs, where they're using this data. So it, it's, it's blown up in that regard. And it's now wow. influencing five different sciences, from sociology to mammalogy to psychology to philosophy. I mean, anyways. Because I also think it was so easy to understand. You explained it in a way that was so easy to grasp. Like, I just grasped it. Great. Right away, yeah. just because of the way you explained it. So basically, the idea is, is that, um, as we spoke earlier, um, you know, we have this conversation that's going on, this, this self-talk dialogue, and someone will say, what is he talking about? That's what I'm talking about. That thing that said, what is he talking about, is, a, a, is what we call a self-talk thought form. And this inner dialogue is going on all day. And we can measure how many self-talk thought forms we have by the impulses that the brain makes. And right now we say on average, um, you, each human being has around 50,000 self-talk thought forms every day. So every day this thing's going off and it's just doing what it's doing. And it's just constantly in a conversation and dialogue with itself. Now, <clears throat> the average human being who is, <coughs> excuse me, the average human being who's interacting with their brain and who's conscious of it and working with it even, is only aware of about 5% of these 50,000 self-talk thought forms. And so that means that we're aware of around 2,500 of them, right? And um, so to take that information a little bit further is that one of the things that we can measure is whether or not the brain is making a positive um, thought form or a negative thought form based on the biochemistry and the, uh, the, the, um, the, the brain activity that occurs as a result of the thought form. And so out of these 50,000 thought forms, what we've learned is roughly 80% of them or 40,000 of them are negative or limiting in some way. So this reticular activating system that we're talking about, this filtering system to make you right, right, mm -hmm. is really focused on the negative kind of aspects of our reality. And we're constantly judging ourselves and judging the world. And it is, as you said earlier, a four to one ratio. For every one positive thought that we have, we have four negative ones that are pushing up against it and fighting against it. Wow. So that's so what- See what a person so, is up against. It really puts yeah. it very clear, you know? Exactly. So, so when we talk about that, um, that's, when you, that's where the word unplugged comes from. Right. Because um, can we unplug that, right? You know, yeah. Now, I had previously said that you know, we're only aware of around 5%, which is 2,500 of them. And so then of that 2,500, 80% or 2,000 of them are negative or limiting, limiting in some way. So we have 500 positive thoughts a day and 2,000 negative ones that we're attending to and interacting with. So can you unplug it? It's like, no, you're going to plug from it, but you can't unplug it. So unplugged represents that whole 50,000 thought forms, 80% negative or limiting in some way. We're aware of 5% or 2,500 of them, of which 2,000 are negative and limiting, a four to one ratio. That's what unplugged represents. So that's what the first psychological experiments are about. Now, dog, so unplugged, now dog. Dog represents something um, 
where I'll just give the experiment real quickly. They took right. a little doggy and they put the dog in a maze and they had a little metal on the bottom, a little screen, and they could give a gentle little um, electric shock to the dog's paws. And it would be like, whoa, what's that? And it would run and go through the maze and get out. So stimuli response, shock, run, shock, run, shock, run, shock, run. Dog just got used to every moment that the shock went off, boom, take off. Run. <laughs> so then they put a harness on the dog. And that harness made it so that the dog can't move. And so then they put it back in the maze and they shock its little paws and it tries to move and it can't. And they shock and tries to move, tries to move. And finally, it just gives up and they shock it and it just sits there, just shock, sits there completely passively receiving the shocks, not even trying to run away, right? Then they take the harness off and they put it back in the maze and they shock its paws and to their amazement, it doesn't move. And they shock it again, shock it again. It's completely free. It's completely unbound. It can do anything it wants to do. And it just sits there and passively receives the shock. So in this one, we understand the conditioning of a person, right? The condition. Exactly. This, this came to be known as the learned helplessness phenomena. Mm -hmm. So that it learned that it was helpless. And now it just thinks it's helpless no matter what happens. It's completely free to not be helpless. But because it has learned helplessness, it now lives as though it's helpless. Right. Right. And the learned helplessness phenomena. So that's what dog represents. So unplugged, the 50,000 thought forms, 80% negative or limiting in some way. Dog, the learned helplessness phenomena. And then dreams. Um, you know, brain, brain scientists back in the 50s and 60s were trying to figure out what, what dreams were all about. What, what, what do they serve? What, what function? Why do we dream? I mean, you know, what's going yeah. on in this thing? They didn't know. And they didn't have the sophisticated, you know, equipment that we have today uh, to, you know, measure brain activity and what have you. And so they designed an experiment to kind of study what the dreamless mind would be like, what happens when the mind's not allowed to dream. Right. And so they devised a research process where they took the, you know, the grad students and who agreed to do this. And, you know, when we begin to dream, our eyes dart back and forth inside with our eyes closed and it's called rapid eye movement. And so we can tell someone is beginning to dream when their eyes begin to move back and forth. And so what they did in the dream lab or in the sleep lab was that the moment that the, the eyes would begin to dart back and forth, they would kind of nudge the person and not wake them up fully, but nudge them enough to stop the dreaming process. And after, I think it was two days of doing this experiment, they stopped it. And they then put out an alert to all research facilities and telling them, whatever you do, don't do this experiment. Because everyone who was in the experiment started becoming really upset and violent and violent oh, towards wow. themselves, violent towards others, really severely depressed that dreaming was not allowed, not being allowed to dream literally uh, upset the whole cart in a really bad, violent <laughs> horrible, don't right, ever right. do this experiment again kind of way. <laughs> Anyways, so here we are now, years later, 20, 30 years later, and we have all these really advanced kind of, you know, neurological mapping systems. And, and what we've come to learn is that there is zero difference, okay, zero difference between the brain activity that occurs when we dream at night and the brain activity that occurs when we daydream during the day. Okay, so that those activities and what happens in the brain are the same. So now here comes the findings of these unplugged dog and dreams. So we attempt as individuals to dream a better life, to dream a better way, to improve ourselves in some way. Yet we have these four to one negative thought forms in the unplugged dog dreams area you know, waking us up from our dreams. Oh, you can't do that. What do you think about that? You need to just, you know, get to work and don't bother trying to change this or da, 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 da. And all this negative self-talk that wakes us up from our daydreams of trying to improve our life, which then leaves us in a state of learned helplessness. And so all we, it's, it's a self-defeating system that's active in all of us. So and, Dr. And Joe, we, what's one tip? What's one tip that you can share with us to kind of get out of this? self-helplessness state. Yeah. I don't have a clue. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I haven't figured that one out. You're on your own, kiddo. I'm just telling you what's going on, you know? No. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, 
that's what I do, you know? <laughs> right, um, right. And answer, it, boy, you know, is it what is there one thing? Well, the first yeah, just thing like one is, tip, well, one little yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. The do. first thing is to to um, go listen to that audio. I mean, really, so that yeah. you really kind of ground this information and the 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 more in depth, detailed explanation of it that that mm -hmm. is provided in the book. Um, but you know, Satchitananda, you know, said something once that you know, once you begin to once you once you become aware of something, you then can begin to know it. Yeah. And so, unless you expose yourself to this knowledge, and unless you expose yourself to the possibility, you'll never become aware of it and be able to work with it. Mm -hmm. And so, the key element is to begin to realize that this is the system that is operating right now in your brain. Absolutely. Uh, we have not found a human being who's able to escape this reality that this is how this is the the evolutionary step that is currently going on in our brains now there are lots of people out there who including neuroscientists who would say that there are many individuals that are taking advantage mm -hmm. of these systems in order to kind of keep us down if you will in a psychological straitjacket you know so that we don't you know, try and change the system or change the way we share money or change the way we share food or change the way we relate to other countries and on and on and on. Right. And so we could get into those conspiracies and I don't even call them theories, but those conspiracies. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not where I go with this information. You know, it, it's really a process of beginning to learn who and what you are. You know, yeah, this is, I, I, this I is, think. I think what I'm getting from this is really the process of really understanding your mind and its functions and how yeah. your mind works and how your mind uh, is a machine, is a machine within you. And that if you can learn how to operate it properly, yeah. um, well, then you can create that peace of mind. Well, one thing that's so important to understand about specifically that, you know, is that, and, and if there is one thing for people to understand, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that would be that, you know, what happens to someone in your presence, so what, 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 how people react to you, what happens to people in your presence mm -hmm. is a function of who you are, not what you know. Okay? Right. And who you are, who you are busy being, is whether or not is the person who is either at peace or not at peace with everything that's ever happened to them. So if you are someone who went through childhood traumas and you have not come to peace with them and understand and reconciled them, you are then carrying that vibration inside of you. And in one of my lectures, I talk about if you take two guitars and you tune them and you set them about 10 feet apart, one guitar here, one guitar here, mm -hmm. and you go and you, and you pluck, one of the strings on this guitar, the string on this guitar will begin to vibrate. Oh, wow. You mute, you mute the guitars and then you, plick, you pluck a different string on this one and the string over here will begin to vibrate. And it's called the principles of resonance. So these unresolved issues from your childhood, these unresolved vibrations that you're carrying is like one of those guitar strings and your reticular activating system is going to find the other guitar strings out in the world to justify this unresolved feeling because it doesn't feel good. But you clean this up and then you no longer attract those types of realities and your, reticulating art, or your reticular activating system can't find that data because it's not looking for it. Right. So it all starts in the process of really understanding these cycles of seven that I was talking about mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and, and beginning to understand what your self-talk is all about. Um, it's learning the difference between guilt and shame. You know, mm -hmm. guilt is a feeling. Guilt is our, our consciousness. It is, it is our guide. Guilt is healthy. Like you do something, you realize it hurts someone when you do that or didn't want the results. And so you learn that. So next time you go to do it, the guilt comes up. You know, ooh, okay, I don't do that. Nope, we don't do that. And then shame, though, is very different. Shame is a belief. Mm -hmm. Shame is a belief about yourself that something's wrong, you're messed up, God didn't, you know, blew wrong. it with the mold or whatever. And so shaming beliefs are really what cause our reticular activating system to find all these negativities. So it's learning to understand what shaming beliefs are controlling your reality. And, you know, there's a book by um, John Bradshaw, and I talk about it in my book, and I give some of the exercises um, in my book. Um, <clears throat> but um, it, it's called healing the shame that binds you. 
and it helps you to begin to uncover what are these negative thoughts that are controlling your reality and then realize that you know are you going to believe those mm -hmm. or is that something that somebody put into you you know um the other thing to realize and we only have a couple more minutes here yeah um, yeah i have one last that, question so i want to make sure i can like <laughs> well just real real quickly i mean yes. one of the things that i like to my whole thing my whole my whole game is about yeah. leading people to what i call their pre-identity state Mm. You know, there's, there's a piece of the brain called the hippocampus and the hippocampus is responsible for separation consciousness and all of your self-concept, the I, I am this, I am that. Right. And for the first 18 months of our lives, it's dormant. It's not on. And so we have no separation consciousness for between the first 16 months and 20 months of our lives. There's no separation consciousness whatsoever. Now, when that hippocampus turns on, all of a sudden the eye shows up and I this and I that and I love broccoli and I'm fussy when I go to bed and I don't like kitties or cats or whatever. And everything that that eye says about itself, mm. it downloaded or heard someone say about them when they were a child. And so we just accept Whatever it is someone describes us as, as who we are, whether it was conscious or not. And so my work is all about getting to what I call the pre-identity state so, state, so that we can all be who we are here to be, as opposed to be doomed to who it is we were told we were. That's so delicious, because uh, basically what it is is uh, who you're told you were is who you're playing out, but it's not really who you are. They're exactly. Just, yeah. yeah. That, oh and my then God, this reticular is, activating right. system is just, you know, reinforcing Wrong. it, reinforcing it until you take control, say no more. I want to understand this stuff. And you begin reverse engineering all of it. You know, my Wrong. book is a good place to start. My book isn't just a description of all this stuff. Right. Half of the book, I mean, half of the book, 180 pages is what I call recipes for repeatlessness. The half of the book is all of the techniques and tools that I have tried. There's nothing that's theoretical in this book. It is all right. practical, true and tr tried and true information. And it's a smorgasbord because not everything I did is going to work for you. Right. And not everything that works for you is going to work for me. So I have 185 pages of all different types of tools and meditations and exercises and awareness things and things that you can do to try on certain things to see what works for you. What's your it. recipe? for repeatlessness right you know? no i love it oh my god so much so much good so much good food you fed us tonight you know and um first i want to thank you so much for coming on myself but i will never let you go without asking you this question All if right. you had one piece of advice that you can give people who want to live their life the way they picture it to be just like you did uh dr joe what can you leave us with uh tonight or today You know, usually I prepare for things like this and it's great. No, this it's got to come from the heart. Yeah, yeah just... I know. That's why I don't like having pre-interview questions. Yeah, right? me too. So... Yeah. Hmm. I guess really learning to love and accept yourself. It, it all starts there in the reparenting of yourself. Learning how to love, being able to love yourself for not being able to love yourself right you know it's accepting yourself and you know understanding that that um you're not immune from any emotions you're not immune it's okay that you get upset it's okay that you get frustrated and it's okay that you experience bliss and beauty all at the same time and try not to cling to any one of those you know not try try don't try and push away the upsetness or the frustrations and stuff like that because those aren't going to the more you push the the more they exist if you will Right. So, so the back, key element back to love. Is, back to love. Well, back to accepting yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, learning to love and accept yourself because no one's going to do it for you. That's right. Okay. I can't love you to health. You That's can only truth. love yourself to it. When I was sitting there in ICU and I've got 28, you know, mm -hmm. tubes and 14 machines keeping me alive after 12 hours of being brain dead and rigor mortis going through my body and all my organs shutting down, those machines aren't what healed me. It was my love of myself. And it was my love and caring and nurturing of myself that turned on those self-healing mechanisms and gave myself the strength and the opportunity to be in front of you today without those machines.
Right. No, absolutely. Well, you're definitely an example. And I'm so happy that uh, you survived and you're, you know, you're, uh, <laughs> you know, you're sharing know. all your, yeah, right. You're sharing you all me? this, right. You're sharing all <laughs> this knowledge with us. And uh, for anybody who absolutely uh, wants to work with uh, Dr. Joe Mar Mar Marshalla, uh, you, you can go on his website. <laughs> at the, yeah, it's that the was w close. Right, yeah, yeah. I'm like, hold on. Did I say it right? It's, yes, it's Marshalla. So go on joemarshalla.com or you can go and, uh, you know, uh, get his book. You can start there. You can reach out to him. And uh, basically, you know, uh, everything that he shared with us tonight will give you a new awareness, a new perspective. And uh, bottom line is if you don't take the time uh, to understand the machine that is operating you, uh, you pr pretty much kind of repeat the same, uh, you know, patterns that you have over and over. And yep. at the end of the day, those patterns are not even yours. They were passed on down to you. So uh, thank you so much for shedding the light. Is there anything that you'd like to share with the uh, audience? No, you said that so beautifully said, and succinctly. Okay. I didn't even need to come on the audience. <laughs> All right. So we loved having you on Lifestyles of the Jet Setters and Celebrity Entrepreneurs. We look forward uh, to seeing you grow and we're going to keep watching you and uh, we'll cross paths at some point again. Thank you so much for your time and your knowledge. You're so welcome and thank you everybody. Yeah. And you know, it, Last word real quick. I mean, you know, if you've got a question, go ahead and email me. I mean, oh. this is what I do. You can't interfere with my life. I'm, I'm here to be of service. And if you leave me your phone number in the contact sheet, I'll give you a call. I mean, I make, you know, dozens of calls a day to people who left me their number just to talk about these things and kind of give them some tools that whether they're my tools or somebody else's. I mean, we're here to uplift and nurture each other. And so if I can be of service to your incarnation, let me know and I'll it. do whatever I can. So call Joe or email That's Joe. That's right. <laughs> Get a cup of Joe. <laughs> Get a cup of Joe. Exactly. I love it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have, have a beautiful a, day. Have a great one. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Aloha.